Wow, thank you so much. It's so lovely to be with you here um, in Exeter, and uh, thank you for such a lovely, warm welcome. It's a real, real privilege um, to be here. Now, um, back in the day, um, I used to do a lot of youth work, and I used to do loads of school assemblies. Now, I don't know if you remember your school assembly. I don't know if you remember it being the most riveting, exciting, <laughs> dynamic moment of your school life. Anyone is uh, uh, want to admit to that? No teachers in the house, no? And um, uh, I remember this kid telling me a story, and he said, basically, they went into the assembly hall, and on, at the front of the, on the stage, there was a table. And on the table, there was a bunch of delicious-looking apples. Um, and above the uh, apples was a sign that had written. It said this, take one apple only, God is watching. <laughs> and so the kids looked terrified. You know, they'd come up, they'd take the apple, have a quick look around, and, uh, and then go back again. And then on the way out of the assembly hall, there was another table. And on the table there was this delicious-looking chocolate brownie. And a kid had written a sign, and he'd put it above the chocolate brownie. And it said this, Take as much brownie as you want, God's watching the apples. <laughs> and you know, so often we have communicated a God who is mean, yeah. a God who wants to sort of communicate all these rules that's never approachable. But the reality is, is that the God that I serve isn't like that. And, uh, you know, um, for many of us and for many people in the society, sometimes life can feel a little bit overwhelming, can't it? And uh, I sometimes feel like life is uh, like Tetris. Do you remember the game Tetris? Um, like blocks fall out of the sky and you need to get them all in a straight line. And once you get them in a straight line, it disappears. But the problem is more blocks keep coming. And it gets faster and faster and faster. And things always seem to go wrong at the same time, don't they? And then eventually, it's like, game over. I just can't do this anymore. I quite like this slide. Can anyone relate to this slide? <laughs> Put your hand up if you can relate to that slide. <laughs> it's like life doesn't always work out the way I want it to. I've got a plan. And yet, so often, the plan goes pear-shaped on me. I've really been inspired by the story of Elijah over recent years, and Elijah sort of sums up that bottom picture in so many ways. He goes through a roller coaster of emotions. And I like the story of Elijah because it feels to me a bit like a Hollywood film, you know. It's got some amazing characters in it and some really awful characters as well. You've got the king and the queen, Ahab and Jezebel. The queen is uh, fascinated by the occult. She erects temples, um, she's driven, she's unpredictable, she's ruthless. And uh, in that culture, people used to worship a god called Baal. Um, Baal was meant to be in charge of the weather. So the way they worshipped him was they used to sacrifice children and they used to um, whip themselves. And they wanted to keep Baal happy because um, that's the way they made their living is through agriculture. And so the whole thing is, we've got to keep Baal happy. And then you've got the double agent, 007, Obadiah. He's like in the temple gates. He's hiding the prophets of God. And then you have Elijah. And Elijah must have heard all the stories of sacrifice, all the stuff that was going wrong. And he must have been one of those prayer warriors. And I think he must have got to that place where he realized that he was the answer to his own prayer. That God was calling him to step out and do something. And he must have confronted all that anxiety as he confronted the most evil powers of the time, Ahab and Jezebel. And you know, 1 Kings 17, he basically goes up to them and says, you know what, there'll be no more rain nor dew until I say so. No more rain, no more dew. Who's meant to be in charge of the weather? Baal. So this was a massive insult. And I wonder what Elijah thought was going to happen after that. Well, what happens is he has to leg it to the desert, to a place called the Cherith Ravine. Now, when I um, sort of did the story of Elijah in Sunday school, I'd imagine he'd be sort of, you know, sunbathing by this beautiful stream, um, getting a tan. There'd be like these birds that came down, ravens came down and fed him Burger King, you know, quarter pounders. <laughs> it would have been a nice moment. But actually, the reality is God sent him to a place that was rough. Um, ravens were unclean birds carrying raw meat. The 
It was a murky place, a muddy place. The weather was 120 degrees without shade. The stream was thick with algae. And he was by this brook for uh, a whole year. God was still providing. The miraculous was still happening. 700 times he got fed, but he was in a lonely place. And then the word of God comes to him and says, you've got to go to Zenopath. Now, Zenopath is Jezebel's hometown. And he must be thinking, oh, come on, give me a break. It's full of Baal worshippers. Why do I want to go there? But he's had no human company for a year. So he arrives. And the first person God tells him to go to is this suicidal woman who's gathering sticks for her last meal. And he must have thought, seriously? Really? And uh, so he goes up to this woman, you know, and you know the story that God provides. He tells her to go home and cook, and the miraculous happens again. And he, he's sort of part of this family, and it's all going okay. But then the roller coaster happens again. The son dies. And who does this widow that he's been caring for blame? Elijah! Apparently, it's his fault. And so you know the story that Elijah cries out to God. He lays on the dead body, something that no one would ever do, touch a dead body. It's like, stuff it, I'm going to pray, I'm going to lay on this body, I'm going to see him healed. And he gets healed. And suddenly, it's all good again. And then, the climax, I guess, to the Elijah story is he gets sent to Carmel. And this is the showdown with the prophets of Baal. And the showdown is, is that there's going to be an altar and that the God of the Baal, um, there's going to be a test that he's going to have to set fire to the altar. And then Elijah's God would have the same test. And of course, the Baal worshippers, they whip themselves. They get them out into a frenzy, trying to persuade their God to act. Nothing happens. And then Yahweh um, destroys the altar. And many of the prophets of Baal perish. At that point, I think Elijah must have thought, get in job done, book tour. Let's do this. Let's do the speaking tour. Let's get the t-shirts made. We are out of this place. Here is success. But actually, it didn't work out the way he thought it was going to. And you know, the challenge is, isn't it, if we're real and honest, sometimes life is a little bit, can get disappointing. Um, prayers don't always get answered the way we want them to. People do get ill. Relationships do break down. Marriages do fall apart. Prayers don't always get answered. Accidents happen. Redundancies are made. Test results come back from hospitals with terrifying news. And sometimes we get in that place going, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 5. This is um, Elijah. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. May the gods deal with me it be ever so severely if by this time tomorrow... I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba and Juba, he left his servant there. While he was there, he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he may die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I know better than my ancestors. You see, Elijah is in a really, really low place. Thinking one thing. And you know, it's not that the miraculous didn't happen. He saw the miraculous. And, and I'm saying this morning is that we have to sometimes live in the tension of these things. We have to be honest and real about it. That sometimes it does happen. Sometimes it doesn't. We don't always get the answers here on earth. But you know, Elijah was desperate at this point that he wanted to take his own life. Now, um, for my story, I guess, um, I was that classic Christian worker. You know, I founded a charity 20 years ago, grew to a really big charity, it's doing really, really well, amazing stuff. But I worked so hard, I would burn myself out, and then I'd rest for a little bit, and then I'd burn myself out again, and then I'd rest a little bit. It was a little bit like, I don't know if you've ever done this, you know, you put your phone on charge for 10 minutes, and you have 20% left, right? <laughs> You, your phone works perfectly on 20% as it does on 100%. There's no difference. It can do the same things. It just doesn't last very long. And so you go through this cycle time and time again. But my motivation was always really, really, really high because there were kids in my community getting stabbed. There was huge issues of poverty and injustice. And uh, so I was, I was pumped. I was motivated all the time. Those things moved me to do stuff. And, uh, and because of the sort of stuff we were doing, we would get a lot of interest. You know, we get a lot of politicians wanting to visit what we do, normally a week before the election um, with 40 TV cameras. And, uh, and I met, I've met many prime ministers and uh, one politician, I don't like to mention his name, but he has blonde hair and he doesn't comb it very often. <laughs> um, 
and um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but then came the moment that we got a phone call from Kensington Palace that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, the future King of England, wanted to come and see what we were doing. In fact, they loved it so much, they came twice within a year, which never happens. And they spent three or four hours talking to some of our young people, um, chatting to me. And I remember on the last time they visit, I was outside of the church um, that we were based at, and uh, I was talking to Catherine, and there were literally a sea of photographers. I mean, there literally, probably as many people as here today, it's just imagining all you were here with a, with a camera flashing. <laughs> and it was so intimidating. I turned to Catherine and I basically saying, how on earth do you do this? This is crazy every single day. I don't know how you live like that. And what happened was, is I went home, I did an interview for the six o'clock news, BBC, and then the photos went literally around the world. It was like OK Magazine, Hello Magazine, um, all the national papers, so much stuff online. And I guess the show reel, my Facebook page that day, looked pretty impressive. It looked like, God, Patrick's doing all right, isn't he? But in that photo, I am anxious, I'm lonely, and I'm starting to suffer from depression. Because I communicate the show reel, but the behind the scenes is something else. And for too long, maybe in the church, we communicate the show reel. And I'm not saying that's not important, because there's some great things, but actually there's another story. And to be honest, I got to a place um, where I just got a little bit fed up of pretending. I got a little bit fed up of the unrealness sometimes. And, uh, and often, you know, I'd never heard a decent sermon on mental health. I've been in so many church services in my life. I've never heard anyone talk about it um, in real detail. And, uh, you know, and, but when they did, um, you know, I was taught anxiety is not trusting God enough. I was taught depression is a sin. Um, I didn't have enough faith. And I'd go out the doors feeling guilty and broken, more worse than when I came in. Because I was thinking, you know what, God, I'm just letting you down the whole time here. I'm just, I just can't do this. I'm trying to muster up any faith. I repented of every sin that I could possibly think of. In fact, I made some sins up just to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was. So I wrote this book called Honesty Over Silence. And it's, it's been crazy, actually. Um, we also did a DVD of it. And we did a TV show recently of it that's coming out in July, um, July the 7th. And I just wanted to write something that was real and honest. But the problem was, is there were many times writing it, I was like, you know, I'm not sure I can go on with this. Everyone's going to think I'm backslidden. And, and I read the Psalms. And the Psalms, 40% of the Psalms are laments. Yeah. They're David crying out to God, going, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust in you. I think that's a miracle. Yeah. When life gets really tough, you know, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust in you anyway. And so what I wanted to do with the book and the DVD and the TV thing is I wanted to interview some of my friends, um, just ordinary people, people that would never probably stand on a platform like this, who are just incredible. And the first person I interviewed for the book and the DVD was Rachel. Um, Rachel Wright, um, she's a lovely lady. She's got a kid with a life-limiting condition. Um, she gives him 20 injections a day. Um, he has to be turned uh, every couple of hours. She has, has to have carers in her home, and he needs 24-7 care. And, uh, and I was talking to her about faith, and she was like, you know, my faith sustains me. I can't do it without my faith. I think that's a miracle. And, uh, and then um, she says, so often, you know, in Christian circles, we talk about seasons, don't we? And she goes, next season is my son dies. I don't want the season to change. I spoke to another one, one of, one of my best friends, in fact, um, John Sutherland. He's a Met commander. 1,500 police officers used to work to John. And uh, absolutely amazing guy, and he was sort of tipped to go the whole way. And uh, a number of years ago now, um, he was down A&E. And, uh, and I'm thinking, obviously, being a police officer, um, living where we lived at the time, I think he's been stabbed, he's been shot, something's happened, oh my goodness. Yeah, he had a breakdown. Anxiety just got the best of him. And I remember going to see him afterwards, and you know, I've worked out with people that go for these times. Sometimes they don't want to be given loads of advice or, or fixed, they just want to be loved. And uh, so I just went around once a week, and uh, we just chatted about all sorts of different things. But I remember him saying to me, you know what, Patrick, the whole man up thing hasn't worked, has it? Man up, we're told. Some of us blokes here, man up, hide your emotions, don't tell people how you're feeling. 
be a real man. Yeah. Utter rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. We need to have an honest conversation. Yeah. Yeah. The third person, um, well, a couple actually, um, Alan and Jackie Slough, and uh, they run a lovely little um, coffee shop in Stowe, and we were stopping off there, and uh, they'd read one of my previous books, When Faith Gets Shaken, um, looking at where is God in suffering, and um, so they knew who he was. We just started chatting in their coffee shop, and they started telling me their story, and, uh, and they said, I want to come on TV, I want to tell our story, and I tried to persuade them not to, um, like I often do with people who want to tell vulnerable stories, but... We prayed about it, and uh, their story was their 16-year-old son um, completed a suicide. And, uh, and I was like, why would you want to talk about this? And they were like, well, six and a half thousand people in this country complete suicides every single year. Why are we not talking about this? It's like if six and a half thousand people in this country, the BBC did this to me the other day, they went, got eaten by bears, we would do something about it. In fact, if 10 people got eaten by bears, we'd do something about it. You know, we would sort it out, right? Yeah. But actually, here's a thing that we're not talking about. And actually, the whole suicide thing, you know, again, the misconceptions around it is people think, well, that's a selfish thing to do. Actually, I'll tell you what, if you're in that place where you think your life, people will be better off if you wasn't there, that is a desperate, painful, lonely place to be. Yeah. And I've been in that place sometimes where I thought, you know, well, maybe, you know, my wife, my kids, they'd be better off without me. They'd get over it eventually, but maybe they'd be better off without me. And, uh, and that is a desperate place to be. You know, every single day on our railways, today and tomorrow, unfortunately, people will complete suicide. We have got to have an honest conversation. We have got to change the dialogue around this. And Elijah was in that place. And remember, Elijah had seen the miraculous. Elijah had seen incredible things happening. When I was researching for the book, um, there's a chapter called Letting Go of Anxiety. And uh, when I write, I tend to do loads of research. And uh, so what I did is I, I read all the theologians to get what they're saying, and a real variety of theologians, different points of view. And then I read the psychologists as well, and uh, try and work out what they're saying. And uh, so I do loads and loads of stuff. And when it came to the chapter on anxiety, I just wasn't very happy with it, because it was all very technical, you know, fight or flight, um, and all that stuff we've heard before. So then I started reading blogs of just ordinary people talking about their experience. And I came up with a bit of a list, and, uh, which is this. Anxiety is your brain not being able to turn off. Anxiety is the unanswered text message that kills us inside. Especially WhatsApp, right? Because you can tell it's been read. <laughs> so annoying. Why don't they just answer straight away? I don't understand. It believes every negative scenario that you come up with. It's the inaccurate conclusions drawn as your mind takes off and you have no choice to follow its lead. It's apologising for things that don't require you to say sorry. It's self-doubt and a lack of confidence. It's trying to fix something that isn't a problem. It's the fear of failure and striving for perfection then beating yourself up when you don't get there. It tells you you're wrong, they don't like you. It's constantly asking the what-if questions. And I went through all that, and I thought, well, that describes me quite well. But I, I couldn't find a definition. I, didn't, I, I wanted a definition to put in the book. And then I came across this, and I thought, oh, my goodness. More than anything else, anxiety is caring. Yeah. It's never wanting to hurt someone's feelings. It's never wanting to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the want and the need to be accepted and liked. So you try too hard sometimes. You try too hard sometimes. And I get it, you know, one in four of us will struggle at any one time with this. So there'll be people here today who are going, oh my goodness, that's me. Let's be real, let's be honest about this stuff. Um, I, I use these little diagrams to talk about this sometimes, I quite like this. This is called anxiety. Maybe we'll have some anxiety later. Um, what if nobody likes me? What if I taste weird? What if I'm too cold? What if I'm too hot? What if I'm just right and I can never live up to it again? <laughs> the pearls of overthinking. What if I've made a mistake? What if people don't like me? Am I good enough? Am I doing the right job? Everyone's staring at me. I'm doing this wrong. You know, Elijah was in this broken place, this depressed place. And it's interesting that one of the things that really helped me, actually, was realizing that if you suffer from anxiety and depression, it's not necessarily your fault. Because yeah. what we do is we just beat ourselves up the whole time. And, uh, and so we suffer from shame as well. <laughs> you know, guilt and shame are two very different things. Guilt is, I've done something wrong. Shame is, I am wrong. 
Um, shame has two voices. It says, who do you think you are and you're not enough? Yeah. Brene Brown famously says, shame loves silence, secrecy, and judgment. Yeah. But it can't stand empathy. It can't stand being told. It can't stand coming out of the darkness. Yeah. But one of the things that really helped me was this guy, um, a psychiatrist. Uh, he wrote a book called um, Curse of the Strong around depressive illness. And he said that he can tell nine times out of ten the personal characteristics of someone that is suffering from depression. And he said, they, they are these. Moral strength, reliability, diligence, strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, vulnerable to criticism, self-esteem, dependent on the evaluation of others. People that struggled with this, Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill, Mother Teresa, they are not weak people. I've come to the conclusion that people that often suffer from depression, panic attacks, anxieties, have just simply tried to be strong for too long. And you know, and sometimes, particularly people with anxiety, incredibly sensitive, beautifully sensitive sometimes. They can pick up the pain in someone else so quick, because there's a flip side to everything, right? Our strengths are also our weaknesses. And so part of it is actually becoming really self-aware of what's going on in our lives and stop beating ourselves up over it. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Matthew 11, 29 to verse 30, says this, a message version. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You know, the fact is, this passage is talking about intimacy with God. It's saying, work with me. You see, if you have suffered from depression and anxiety, you need to hear this from me this morning. You are not a failure. You are not a failure. It is not true. Stop listening to that voice. You are not a failure. We all get broken. An image that really helped me um, uh, going through a really tough time is um, uh, this image of Kintsugi. So if we break a pot, we tend to mend it with super glue, right? And then we go up to our parents. I used to go up to my parents and go, it's not really broken. I think I should have just left it on the table, to be honest. But uh, so for some reason, I had to tell her it wasn't broken. And the idea is we hide the cracks. We want to try and pretend it's all OK. So what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique. There isn't an object like that now on planet Earth because every single one of you is bespoke. You're individually made, made in the image of God. And actually, beauty can come from brokenness. Scars are not there to be ashamed of. That God pours in the gold. The gold is the love and the compassion. And he starts to bring healing and he starts to do stuff. I don't get why some stuff happens. But I do get that God, in his wisdom and his love, he does bring restoration. And he starts to use some of the challenging stuff in our lives to bring love and compassion to other people. God is a God of brokenness. And we need to be that. So there are three lessons I really feel like we could learn from Elijah in this point. And I think it's always God's response to Elijah, which I think is brilliant. 1 Kings um, 19, 5 to 9 says this. It talks about Elijah being crushed by disappointment, and then God comes up to him. And you know what? God does not go, come on, Elijah, cheer up a bit, mate. You know, Carmel, pretty impressive, wasn't it? Prophets of Baal, we sorted them out, didn't we? You know, remember the widow? She was, you know, suicidal. Remember that? That was good. Sheriff of Veen, ravens. I know it was raw meat, but never mind. It was okay. We did all right. There was no pet talk. There was no remember the good old days, the old victories. It was like, you're tired. So he sent an angel. The angel cared for him tenderly, providing him with food. He was exhausted. He said, you need to sleep. Mike Iaconelli says this. Most of us don't come home at night staggering drunk. Instead, we come home staggering tired, worn out, exhausted, and drained because we live too fast. I used to hate the term self-compassion. When people used to speak about that, I'd be like, that's an excuse for Christians to do nothing. And I don't need any excuse for Christians to do nothing. We are activists. We need to go and change the world. And I'm like, I totally misunderstood it. I've come to realize that self-compassion and self-indulgence are two really different things. 
Self-compassion takes discipline. Self-compassion is actually maybe saying no to that extra glass of wine just because it takes the edge off, and that's what we escape into. It's saying no to that extra food that actually makes us feel guilty in the end anyway. Self-compassion might be saying yes to volunteering because actually caring for others is one of the best things that you can do for your mental health. Self-compassion may involve discipline. It may mean that you might need to get to the gym. But self-compassion is this, is talking to yourself the way you would talk to one of your close friends. That's what it is. Me and Mark have been friends for years. I've got so much admiration and respect for him as a man of integrity. And like, if he came up to me and he was like, Patrick, I'm tired, I'm worn out, people in Exeter doing my head in, <laughs> just moan about everything, do they realise how hard I'm working, and, uh, you know, family, it, it's complicated, I, and I go, Mark, come on, mate, pull yourself together, you know, you've you, you got a good job, you get paid, a lot of people don't have jobs, you know, you should try a little bit harder, be a bit more grateful, you should try this and try that, come on, mate, you shouldn't be like this, you ought to be stronger, I wouldn't dream of treating my mate like that. So why do I treat myself like that constantly? Come on, Patrick, pull yourself together, you idiot, you failed. You know, so often, then people might say something that may reinforce some of the negative stuff that you believe about your stuff. You know, so often what happens to me at Christian meetings is I normally get someone at the end who comes up to me and says they want to tell me something in love. Um, when a Christian says they want to tell you something in love, you just need to run, right? Because they're going to destroy you in three sentences. And uh, normally when that happens to me, I'm like, oh, no. But then, you know, there could be like 10 people who will go, thank you so much. But when I go home at bed at night, there's one thing I'm going to think about. Yeah. It's going to be the negative one. Yeah. And it's going to go on loop in my brain, yeah. around and around and around. And then I'm going to catastrophize, because that's what we do. We go to worst case scenario thinking, and they're thinking, well, they didn't really like me. They're never going to invite me back. I shouldn't be a preacher. I don't know what I'm talking about. And then suddenly I've retired, you know. And uh, it's normally two in the morning and I wake up and then I get my sort of uh, head back together. But the reality is, is compassion means to suffer with, to be conscious of another's distress and pain, to alleviate that pain. So self-compassion is being able to do that for yourself. A good friend of mine sent me this when I was going through a tough time. She said this, note to self, the plan is this, you do what you can when you can, however you can, with whatever you've got. And if you can't, you can't. You rest until you can again. You give yourself kindness so your pockets are full and you reach out and you pull a fistful to offer folks you meet along the way. We need to let go of the critical voice, the inner critical voice. And there'll be some people here, here, you know, you, you live by the shoulds, the musts, the oughts. I should be okay. I must have more faith. I ought to have sorted this by now. This has been going on for too many years. And then people, you know, sometimes helpfully go, well, mental health and physical health, they're the same, you know. And I get, everyone in this room's got mental health, right? <laughs> Every single one of us got physical health, we've got emotional health. But the challenge is, is sometimes you can break your leg and you'll know you're going to get better within six weeks. Some people have been living with this stuff for years and years and years. And I want to say there is, there is a sense that God understands where you're at. Look at the way you treated Elijah. He treated him with love and tenderness. Let go of the critical voice. The other thing I wanted to say is, um, I wrote this book called When Faith Gets Shaken, which is my previous book, and in it, my wife wrote a chapter, um, and, uh, which I was terrified about, um, and it was called Secondhand Smoke. And this whole idea is secondhand smoke can still kill you. And so I get there's people here caring for others, and actually it's not you going through it, but actually you're starting to suffer. Emotionally, it's starting to get tough. Emotionally, it's starting to get hard for you. And, uh, and actually, when we started doing our research, we realized there's not much around caring for the carer. Yeah. And actually, that as a church, as a community, we can really need to look out for each other. The um, second key thing is I've said, get curious about your thoughts. You see, what often happens is um, we get that thought in our head and we feel like we need to take it captive. And the only way we're going to do that is to sort of bash it in the name of Jesus, you know, and uh, name it and claim it, huff it and puff it, blab it and grab it. We need to get rid of it somehow. And actually, what it does, it just makes it worse. Isn't it true? Carl Jung says, whatever you resist persists. And so if I say to you, right, everyone now, clear your minds and please don't think about chocolate. My brain is going mental with Mars bars, Twix, dairy milk. I've got my idea, eye on those Maltesers. 
that have been passed around at the back as I speak, in fact. And, uh, and the fact is, is that suddenly it's really hard. A friend of mine describes it like this, and I think this is really, really helpful, is if you can imagine your thoughts as a train, um, if you go to the London Underground, a train will come every two minutes. And sometimes those thoughts will come every two minutes. And you know what? At some point, you're not going to stop them coming. Yeah. And, and the more you try, the more hit up you get. But you can decide whether you're going to get on the train or not. Yeah, so sometimes you need to just let it go. And sometimes that's just really helpful, naming the thoughts, being self-aware. No, oh, that's why I'm going to die of cancer early thought. I'm going to let that go. That's my everyone in Exeter hates me thought. I'm going to let that go. And sometimes, don't get on the train. And that is the key. That's to how we take captive every thought. You see, don't believe everything you think. Learn to question it. I don't know how many speakers you hear go, doubt, question, look at things from a different angle. Struggling doesn't mean you failed. It means you're human. Who can relate to this image? Positive, 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 negative. It's true. I'm a failure. got to get a different way of thinking. We've got to hear a different voice. The voice of love, the voice of compassion, the voice that says you're made in the image of God. So Elijah was in that place. He had to uh, exercise compassion towards himself and com God's compassion towards him. And secondly, you know, his thoughts would have been running wild because his main thought was I've failed and I'm isolated and I'm the only one left. In fact, God speaks to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? 1 Kings 19 verse 9. To which the prophet replies, I've been really zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. It's so easy, isn't it, when we go through a hard time to think no one understands, no one gets me, no one has been through this. Elijah was in that pit, he was lonely, he was overwhelmed, he assumed that he was last man standing. The reality was there were seven thousand others who hadn't bowed down to Baal. 1 Kings 19 verse 18. He was not on his own. But you know, one of the things that I um, look at society today is even with our, our social media and all the stuff that goes on, we are one of the most lonely societies. You know, um, it's like the stats of loneliness are staggering. You know, we have a minister for loneliness. We have a minister for suicide prevention in this country. They are roles within the government. We have these stats which scare me. It says, being acutely lonely is as stressful as being punched in the face by a stranger and massively increases your risk of depression. The effect of loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Three quarters of GPs between one and five, um, they see between one and five lonely people a day. And I've had a lot of GPs that come up and speak to me and go, it's so true, it happens. We need to be in community. So I'd been running this charity for 22 years. And uh, when it got to 21, I guess there's something significant about the number 21, I really felt God say, um, it's time to let it go. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm a founder. I started it. I've worked really hard. Um, and we don't tend to let go. We tend to just stay in the job until we die. And it was like, no, I, you need to let it go. And, you know, when you sort of birth something and you've worked so incredibly hard and it was really, really tough. But God was like, I'm breaking your heart for something else. I'm breaking your heart for this whole area that we've kept secret for so long. And yet the church is in every community across this country. The church will outlast politicians and governments. And the church is about working relationally with people. We are the best place people to work in this area. And, uh, and so... Um, we started to dream, me and my wife, and we got really passionate about the Kintsugi image. And as we started talking about the Kintsugi image, particularly with non-Christians, it's just an incredible response. Absolutely, it totally took us um, by surprise. And so we started to dream. And you know what vision is, visionaries, they always say, vision is the art of seeing the invisible that produces passion and energy into people. Martin Luther King, when he stood up, you know, Jim Wallace often said, isn't he, when he stood up in Washington, um, he got 250,000 people there without Twitter or Facebook. You know, he got them there and he stood up and he didn't say, I've got a complaint to make. I've got a dream. What's the dream? What's the dream for Exeter? What's the dream for Devon? What's the dream? Because that's what energizes people. That's what produces energy. And suddenly we started dreaming. And so we sort of came up with this, that we wanted to see a world 
where mental and emotional health is understood and accepted with safe and supportive communities for everyone to grow and to flourish. Because if you feel safe and you feel supported, come on, yeah. you can do a lot. If you feel safe and supported, you can do so much. And so what we've decided is, because I guess we were a little bit tired as well, we thought we do not want to start another charity. And, and the fact is, having sort of started one from scratch before, the stress I know about, and uh, this time I've got four kids and a mortgage, whereas when I started XLP, it was just me in a little flat, and I thought, God, I'm not sure I want to do that again. So we started studying movements, and we looked at things like park run. Anyone here do park run? A couple of people. Exeter, you need to get fitter. That's definitely a part of a prophetic word for you guys. Um, we looked at rock choir. Anyone ever done rock choir? And, oh, there's more of a rock choir. That's great. Um, we looked at Weight Watchers. Anyone? No, let's not do that. And we looked at Slimming World and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and all these sort of movements that somehow started in the grassroots and somehow created this sense of belonging, but you don't have to fit in. Because fitting in and belonging are two very different things. And we thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could start seeing something happen where people started being more real, more honest. Brene Brown says we are living in a society that is the most medicated, addicted, obese cohort in the whole of history. We can't carry on the way that we're doing. And so what we decided to do is my wife wrote a, like a 12-week course, sort of similar to the AA course, but around well-being, around looking at people's lives. How can we do this better? And, uh, and we went in our community and we thought, let's just do it as a home group. You know, we'll, we'll, do it, we'll go through it first, you know, make sure it's all kosher. And, uh, but we'll invite a few people, see how they like it. So we went into the playground and uh, we'd go up to someone going, oh, we're starting this Kintsugi Hope Wellbeing group. And they're like, what on earth is that? And then you describe the Kintsugi thing. Oh, oh, the gold thing. Yeah, I've heard of the gold thing. And then it's fascinating. They go, yeah, I'm broken. My husband's just left. Yeah, I'm broken. I'm in debt. I haven't told anyone. I'm an alcoholic. I suffer from anxiety. I mean, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And all this stuff starting to happen, and then through connections and relationships and all different things, suddenly our life group trebled in size. And, uh, and they did the whole thing for 12 weeks. In fact, last week, Sunday, they were all around my house for a barbecue. We had 33 people. Um, Wednesday, they did pub quiz. And suddenly, there's these friendships and these relationships that are starting to form. So we thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we tried to pilot it in other places? And so we basically trained churches up to run it in their community. And uh, Diane does a whole lot of uh, my wife, the teaching through Facebook Live. And so you get all the people coming on each week, buzzing with what's happened. And so the material is always growing. It's, always, it's written in learning styles. There's seven different learning styles that you're probably aware of. And it's been amazing. We've seen it in homeless hostels. Um, we've seen it in other places. And just people coming together and doing life. Um, I remember on the first week, um, I sat down, and I was really anxious about having all these people and, and working, is this going to work out and stuff. And my wife just said, turn to the person next to you and talk about a highlight and a low light in your life. High point, low point. And luckily, I turned to this guy who I'd known my whole life in church. And, uh, and so I turned to him, and we started to talk. And he described some of his story. We'd been in church together for 45 years, praising God. I learned more in five minutes than in 45 years of being in church. In the end, I said to him, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that somehow we've created a culture which means I didn't understand or know what you were going through. And so we, we prayed together. And, you know, this guy's an amazing guy. Absolutely incredible. Can learn so much from him. And it just started happening all over the group because I think we need to let go of this harmful notion that there are those in need and those able to help. We need to realize that we're all in need and we can all help. And now when we do that, there is no them and us. There's just us. And there's a community. And community makes unity and diversity possible. And then we don't have to try and change someone because only Jesus can change someone. We are not the rescuer. He is. He don't really think people want to be loved and not always rescued. And so we want to create a forum where people are going to do that. And I was praying to God when I started this charity and took the risk financially. And we got hundreds of people to support us monthly. And we'll give away books and give away this just to say thank you. But we just like, God, please. Though I cannot deal with another movie of your spirit that's going to be a warehouse in America with a load of session musicians and a famous evangelist and God TV are going to beam it across the world and we're going to call it revival. I'm like, I want to see a move of your spirit 
in the prisons and in the coffee shops and in the schools and in the hospitals and in the pubs and in the parks where ordinary people just come and it isn't led by the great and the good and the massive and the people with the biggest marketing budget it's led by the humble and the broken and the meek and the vulnerable and the courageous and something starts to happen because people start to be honest I like quoting the famous theologian Winnie the Pooh he says this don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Just walk beside me and be my friend. Amen. Beauty comes from brokenness. Um, check out this video. This is me having a go at doing the Kintsugi thing. My youngest son, Nathaniel, was at a friend's house. It was a confrontation with a boy that turned up and decided that he'd take a knife and stab Nathaniel with it. I feel like at that time I was in a bubble and feeling alone and not even knowing how to articulate that to anyone. I had to have major limb reconstruction surgery. Around the same time my daughter got a condition called HSP and my dad got cancer. It was like a perfect storm of things going wrong. And I realised that the anxiety was really taking root in my life. And then you realise that actually you can't just carry on. And you need to show some self-compassion. Bereavement is different for everyone. What's really important is that people are able to talk to someone that they can connect with. And through that, there's a real good healing process. And actually maybe receiving help is letting go of your pride and saying, I am really broken. And as we share in our brokenness, we share in our common humanity. The brokenness is my heart, and it's in pieces. But through time, it's starting to come together again. Discovering treasure in life's scars. Um, the other day, um, we've managed to get a little bit of money together to employ a couple of people, which is incredible. And uh, I'm the only full-time member, but I've got someone who's helping us with admin um, called Ludovine, who's a very precious person. Um, she's from France, and uh, she sent me a WhatsApp, and uh, she goes, I think I'm going to teach you a new word. And the word is flawsome. I don't know if you, anyone ever heard of the word flawsome. It basically means this. I actually thought strange French woman, she hasn't got the English language down to a T at all. You know, she needs prayer. And I looked it up in the dictionary. So I got my dictionary and I looked it up. And flawsome means this. An individual who embraces their flaws and knows they're awesome regardless. How cool is that? <laughs> it's really cool. And, you know, um, as I've been praying and thinking about this morning, I've been thinking those three key themes self-compassion, talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Get curious about those thoughts. You may not stop the train coming, but you can choose whether you're going to get on it or not. And thirdly, there is no them and us. There's just us. We are community. Beauty comes from brokenness. I'll finish with this tiny little story. I won't tell you the full story, but um, about six years ago now, we had a visit in XLP from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I hope you caught that name as it dropped there and um, loads of different things happened and it was an amazing time and he met with our young people and he listened and he talked and um, and uh, I, I'm the I'm the white guy and, uh, and 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 the thing is is it was just an amazing amazing time but we got to the end uh, of our time together and he turned to our young people and he says this you guys need to realize your past doesn't have to define your future. Past doesn't have to define your future. Now, if you're struggling with mental health, that, that is a big one, right? That's a big thing to hear. Your past doesn't have to define your future. And then he turns to this kid. And you know there's always one kid in your youth group that you don't want anyone to ever talk to. <laughs> and because uh, they're just like, trying to, you know, I'm like, God, no, please, not him, no. And he grabbed his hand and went, I'll tell you what you are. You are a VSP. Very special person. You're made in the image of God. You have the potential to change this world. And to be honest, most of the kids didn't know who Desmond Tutu was. So that kid, you know, I'd like to say it was one of those major success stories and he became a Christian. He didn't. I mean, he got his CV sorted, he cut his hair, he went around the estate saying, Desmond Tutu spoke to me um, for a little bit. And, and there was a moment 
there was a moment. I mean, to be honest, most of the other kids, I didn't have a clue what Desmond Tutu, afterwards, this one kid went, oh, it's really nice of um, Trevor McDonald to come down and um, <laughs> hang out with us. <laughs> but then there was a moment where me and Desmond were on our own, you know, and I don't normally get starstruck, but I was pretty starstruck, I'm not going to lie. And, uh, and he turned to me and he said something. And I've done a, a very much longer version of this story in many, many festivals and conferences and churches. And uh, for years, I lied. You're never going to invite me back now, are you? <laughs> I lied. I lied in front of thousands of people. I said, Desmond Tutu said to me, XLP, make God smile. Because I, that's, you know. Um, Desmond Tutu turned to me and said, Patrick, you make God smile. Yeah. But you know, I didn't want to accept it. Because I'm better at listening to the critical voice that tells me all the things that I haven't done right. And all the media opportunities I didn't get right that day and all this happens. But the reality is, you are flawsome. You are a VSP. You are made in the image of God. That is the truth. And that is reality. That's what we need to learn to accept. And that's what we need to learn to help our community accept as well. If you're able, why don't you stand and let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. I thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, that um, when you look down and you see all these people, Lord, uh, I, I just see, see your faces. Um, you see their thoughts. Um, you see their histories. You see their families. You see their concerns for loved ones that aren't here. Um, you see their concerns for loved ones that may don't even know you. Or, uh, and you see the secondhand smoke scenario. Um, Father God, I just pray, just in this time, would your Holy Spirit come? We know your Holy Spirit's here, but we just pray that you'd come in more power right now. And Lord God, where we've criticized, we've beaten ourselves up, and, and it's been more than just the odd criticism, it, it affects us daily. God, I pray that you would speak a different voice, a totally different voice. Father, your word says that you sing over us. Your word says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your word says you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father God, where people feel like because of their struggle, they're a failure. Father, we, we say in the name of Jesus, that's a load of rubbish. Struggling makes you human. It doesn't make you a failure. Where people have lived in shame, God, I pray that actually you'd break the shame this morning and they'd learn to step out of shame. Where people are struggling with anxiety, Lord, I pray that you'd come with your peace. Not in a performance hyped up way, but just in a beautiful way of your Holy Spirit like you do. Jesus. I pray you bring healing today. About this whole area of self-compassion if you're one of those people and there is a lot of us okay who the inner critic is quite loud in your voice you criticize yourself a lot you put yourself down a lot um, other people don't always know about it but you do it a lot you, you think those thoughts about yourself can you just put your hand up I just want to see how many of you guys are because I think it'd be really beautiful if we can pray over you I'd really love to do that So if you are able and you'd like to, could you just make your way to the front right now? Just come, just come. Don't be ashamed. This is all about stepping out of shame. And I get it's hard, I get it's tough, but you gotta realize that um, how loved you are. You are so loved, you are so loved. And there are so many of you. <laughs> come, keep coming, don't, don't, don't. 